Uh, my name is Corey Janke, and I'm a social worker that's worked with the Huntington Society of Canada for 30 years. Um, as in the role of a social worker, um, I have uh, worked with HDO for probably eight years now. I think I've been affiliated with the HDO community um, and just feel so grateful to be able to do this work. Um, my caveat is I'm a lot of fun at a party despite the fact that I'm going to be talking about grief and loss. So um, this is a very big topic and we have 30 minutes to kind of get through it. So I am going to rush through some theory and then we're going to get right into some practicalities around how you manage grief and loss. Okay? <clears throat> so grief is a natural response to any significant loss that we experience. Um, it can be a loss to a person, it can be a loss to an animal, it can be a loss to a lifestyle, it can be just about anything. We often think of the word grief and we think of death. And that is a misnomer because the reaction that we experience to the loss of anything that is significant to us in a relationship, a connection, will, in, uh, will cause the same reaction to happen um, regardless of what it is. Uh, grief is culturally based, so everybody uh, from different cultures will have different ways of grieving. Uh, so it's important to recognize that there is no recipe on how you do this. Uh, there's no timeline on how you do this. It's a very individual experience that uh, will just happen as it unfolds. It, sometimes people give everybody a year. That's the, you know, every, you get through the first of everything and, and, and then come on, get on with it. Some people never, ever stop grieving depending on what it is that is being lost. So remember that there's no right or there's no wrong to grieve. Can everyone hear me okay? I just wanna make sure they're checking. Okay, Okay. so I would be remiss if I did not go back to uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was a psychiatrist who back in 1969, I thought, I think developed a model around grief and loss. And her model at that point was a staged model. And she recognized after studying many, many people, some very common reactions that people would experience after they, uh, they experienced a loss of death. And so her staged model was first there was shock and denial, then there was a bargaining stage that would happen, then there was anger, then there was depression, and then voila, acceptance and everything kind of went on. That was fantastic because she was the first one that actually started to study and talk about death. And before that, we didn't do a great job about it or we didn't document a great job about it. Um, <clears throat> so it was a beautiful beginning. Um, it was a stage model. So she felt you did this and then you did that and then you did this and then you did that. What we know is this is much more true to what grieving looks like. It is messy. There is no straight path. We're continually jumping back and forth between feelings, acceptance, anger, sadness, and it can last for years. I lost my dad 18 years ago, and I can tell you at least twice a year, a song will come on or something will happen, and I burst into tears and go, come on, it's 18 years, but it's still there in the background. This is a nicer picture of what the grief experience can look like. So there's a loss that happens. We automatically will go into a state of shock. That's our body's natural defense mechanism to try to protect us, so not becoming overwhelmed by whatever it is that's shifted. Then we'll go into a state of protesting where the anger can show up, where the ignoring can show up, all that kind of stuff. There's a, always a state of disorganization as we're trying to accommodate living without this individual in our life. Um, and then there's a reorganization, and then we come out the other side of recovery. Again, there are lots of different feelings that happen in each of these moments. It is circular because it, we come and we go, and we move forward, and then we go backwards again. So it is nothing is organically step one, step two, step three. It's just, like that other picture showed, very messy. So the question I have is, do we only experience grief when someone passes away? Exactly, we do not. So as I said earlier, any time we lose a significant something that meant a lot to us that we were attached to, the grief response can happen, okay? So when you think about your HD journey, what are some of the losses that happen in the HD world? 
and just call them out if you don't mind. I don't know if the recording people might like that or not, but your childhood? You're right, you have to grow up quite quickly often, right? What are some of the other losses? Independence, Independence. yes. Yeah. Yes. Right, right, so the dreams, yep. Pardon me? Friends, Friends. yes, yes. People don't understand does it, uh, the Huntington's symptoms. They don't get it, so they will often, uh, out of fear or out of misunderstanding, just kind of drift away a little bit, so you can feel very isolated. What's the average age of onset of Huntington's disease? 35 to 50-ish? How many of us are financially secure at that point? Right. Who's financially secure now? <laughs> so loss of finances, loss of dreams, lots of hopes. There's a lot of losses that happen. So to recognize that just because someone is alive does not mean that we can't grieve. We are grieving all the time in this community. We are grieving all the time as humans, but in this community it's certainly um, escalated because of the intergenerational part of this, the number of family members that are experiencing Huntington's disease. Um, you know, you kind of get through one thing and then something else pops up. It's a progressive disease, so as soon as you get comfortable with one level of function, it changes, and so you have to readapt and go into that as well. So it's a continuous thing that's happening. So what I want to do is start to talk just a little bit about the different types of grief, because most people, like I said, when you talk about grief, believe that grief is the things that happen as soon as someone dies. This first one, anticipatory grief, have anyone heard that expression before? Okay. Oh, hi. <laughs> Um, so anticipatory grief is huge, and I, when I talk to uh, youth at the, at the um, YPAD days in Canada or at HDO camps, many people are surprised to know that you can grieve before the loss has ever happened. So this is kind of a thing that can happen when you recognize that HD is in your family and you actually can understand what HD is and what the implications that has on you and whoever else that's close to you. Um, the anticipatory grief can be when you find out your gene status and you know that you're positive and you're kind of waiting for something to happen down the road. It, it kind of takes away the life that you had kind of envisioned for yourself. And you're constantly on edge, you're, you're symptom checking, you're uh, you know, constantly furiously trying to determine whether you're the same person as you were last week or whether things are changing. So there's that whole anticipation. It's kind of like a, you know, something's coming towards you, but you just don't know when and how hard it's going to hit when it hits. Okay, so there is that part, and that is very, very huge. Anyone heard of disenfranchised grief? Okay. So disenfranchised grief is uh, when you lose something that can't be necessarily recognized by society. Okay, so some people um, don't value pets the way that other people value pets. And so if a dog was to pass away, it's like a child that passed away, and people are like, come on, just get over it, it's just a dog. But in fact, that, that, that loss can be more important than an uncle that's passed away that they didn't have a real strong relationship with. So there's that disenfranchised grief. I had a friend who, for many, many years, was having an affair with a married man, uh, he died of cancer. She wasn't allowed to go to any of the funeral stuff. So she was grieving in privacy the whole time because she wasn't recognized as someone who should be grieving. Right? So that's an example of disenfranchised grief. Ambiguous grief is the loss of a meaningful relationship, but it is different in that it can happen when uh, leaving without a goodbye. So when someone goes missing and the body is never found in an avalanche, for example, that person is no longer there, but there's been no way of kind of finalizing and putting some closure to that. In the Huntington's world, you can have goodbyes without leaving. So if you have a parent who was very active in coaching the soccer and was an active member of the church and golfed every week and all of a sudden has kind of settled into sitting and watching the Golf Channel 24-7 on the thing, and doesn't have any interest in going to see your kids play baseball or whatever, that person is still there, but the person that you knew all your life is no longer there. So that can 
cause a grief response. So the acute grief, that's the pretty common one. That's the one that we feel as soon as a loss happens, right after we get uh, our, our uh, gene status back, whether it's positive or negative, depending on how you kind of prepped yourself for identifying. Um, but it can also happen as people go into long-term care facilities, as people um, lose function and have to lose their jobs or are no longer able to do their job or lose their license. Those kind of things can trigger all of these acute moments in time. Delayed grief, this is another type of grief that is important to recognize and uh, thank God for COVID because this makes so much more sense to people now. How many people do you know that lost loved ones during COVID but weren't able to celebrate the lives until years or months later, right? So the loss has happened but they kind of go on living their normal life and then they start to grieve once that ceremony is able to happen. And in the Huntington's world, cumulative grief, grief is huge. So there's multiple losses um, over a short period of time. So you have various family members, aunts, uncles, grandparents who are experiencing varying symptoms of the disease at varying times. So you're not only kind of focusing and coping and hoping and dealing with one person, you're probably juggling a lot of balls at the same time and you're doing a lot of caregiving. So that is uh, compounding the, the grief experience. Any questions about that? Any of those things make sense? Any of this new information? Yeah, okay. I'm gonna invite you to ask questions as we go along because I know I'm throwing a lot at you in a 15 minute period of time, um, but I wanna get into the other part of it as well, which is um, what we're gonna do about grief. Mass grief is another type of grief, and this is when people start to display physical symptoms or negative behaviors that are out of character instead of allowing the grief to show up the way you want it to or the way it would like to. Complicated grief is when you kind of get stuck, right? You get stuck and you cannot move past the fact that dad is no longer with us. Uh, dad was the person who was supposed to do this with me and was supposed to do that with me. Um, and five years later, it, when you start to talk about dad, the, the um, symptoms show up as if he just passed away yesterday. Right? So you can get stuck in the grief process. And the goal, if you will, is the integrated grief. So accepting the reality of the loss, resuming some form of daily function that has renewed meaning and purpose while keeping that relationship alive. So you flip from a physical relationship and you keep that person alive spiritually through memory, through storytelling, through those kind of things. And that is the ultimate goal if there is ever a goal around um, uh, grief, okay? Used to be you kind of forget about it and you move on. We don't want to forget about it. These people have been fabric of our, of our souls and our, and our DNA forever. We want to be able to move on in our life while we bring parts of them along with us. When I get together with my siblings, we are not together for more than 10 minutes before we have a story of my dad that comes up. When I'm with Kat, we're probably an hour and we hear a story about her mom. So it's that ability to kind of recognize that this person is no longer with us, but they're always with us. So Bonnie's gonna be talking tomorrow about self-care and you've probably heard threads of self-care activity throughout uh, the sessions that you've attended so far. But self-care is a deliberate practice of knowing your needs and desires and taking responsibility for them and living in a way that honors them. All right. So I want you to think about um, various opportunities, opportunities, bad word, various times in your life where you have experienced grief. And I want you to think about what helped you in those moments. And let's just kind of call out, I'm gonna put a couple of things up here just to help with the list, but this is clearly not an exhaustive list. But what are some of the things that you think can be helpful um, to help in grieving the loss of a relationship, the loss of function? Archery. Archery, that's great. Is it? You're the first time I've ever heard that except for Dr. Bonnie, but. <laughs> well, I'm not good at it. Maybe there's that. <laughs> okay. C.
I guess you got to hear that to be experienced, <laughs> find it happy. <laughs> what other things do people do to kind of help them in difficult times? Music, perfect. Yep. Part of me? Spirituality, yes. Prayer can be very helpful or any type of spiritual activity. Arts, perfect. Yes. Hang out with friends. So there are myriads and millions of different ways that we can go. And oftentimes, our nervous system takes us to these places without us even really thinking about it. When we are in acute grief, when we're in anticipatory grief, we are in survival mode. So what that means is our frontal lobe goes offline in those moments, and we go into surviving of fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. And our nervous system has learned through the years of experience about how we make it through how we survive. Sometimes they're really great strategies, sometimes they're not so healthy strategies, but we're learning how to survive. So what I want you to do with the paper that I just handed out to you um, is to start to develop your own care plan, if you will. So you know on every garment, there's a little fabric on, on the inside that tells you how to take care of that garment. So this is your very own care garment uh, directions. So what I want you to do is to think a little bit about when you're really going through a difficult time, what is it that you need to help you in that difficult time? Okay. And I'm surprised no one said chocolate because chocolate's always high on the list. <laughs> so just take about four minutes, five minutes and just reflect because again, what I want to do is start to take what happens unconsciously and we want to make it conscious. And do we have any brave souls who like to share their care directions with anyone? No. <laughs> That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, OK. Always wanted to run with the mic. Thank you. Um, I just listed out things that I do, not particularly in any order, but just that I might do when I needed to do self-care. So I first put laying in bed sleeping, hot, having some sort of hot food, yoga, music, walking, outside time, and dancing. Sure. Um, for one, I play hanging out with friends, but that's only if I'm feeling social. Um, watching, I, I watch a lot of reruns of my favorite shows because it like, comforts me. Um, I like to door dash from like, one of the many favorite places I have downtown. <laughs> Um, treat myself to like something nice, whether it be like a dessert or just like buying something little for myself. I take a lot of baths because it calms me down. And then I like to have something to look forward to. So I go to like a lot of concerts or I try to like book little trips. Yeah, so that's great. So this is a tool that you can use for yourself, but if you have someone in your, in your life that you feel very close and, and safe with, this is also a tool that you can give to them so they know how to help you in these times where we all feel very helpless and we don't know exactly what it is that we want to say or do that's going to be helpful, okay? All right, I know the time is ticking. So, um, any questions? I feel like I've just done this, like I really rip the scab off and then <laughs> be done. Any questions? Yes. Boom, boom, boom. You talked earlier about anticipatory grief. But does that also include the processing of it? Like, um, or is it just the anticipation of the grief that is coming? Because I feel like I had already processed things before the loss. Like, is that a thing or? So it's more a preparation of, right? So we can imagine what it's gonna be like. I feel like there's back feedback. Uh, we can imagine what life's going to be like without this person, or we can imagine what it's going to be like if I test positive, if I test negative. So we're, we're mentally and physically preparing ourselves. It never replaces the actual grief, because we'll never know until we're actually experiencing it. So we, we can fantasize, we can think, that is doing all the things that are helping us prepare. We can learn skills, we can learn strategies in order to do that but it doesn't take away the grief. It's just a type of grief. Okay.
I think too, remembering that how you grieve is okay. I've worked with young people for, for years and I remember on the, the anniversary of, of, for a young man, the anniversary of their dad passing, he just wanted to go to the grave and sit and reflect and his siblings didn't want to and got, he got so upset and we had to have a long talk about what he needs and what his sibling needs, even processing the same loss is very different. And, and sometimes you're not sad all the time. You're allowed to experience joy, as Kat shared this morning, in moments of grief or moments of sadness. And so, you know, I always joke, it doesn't have to be Eeyore, if you know Winnie the Pooh, you know, being followed around by a rain cloud, that you can find joy. And if, because you might have anticipatory grief, your grieving process might feel short and you might feel guilty that you're, you're back enjoying life, but that's what your process is. So just knowing what you need and being able to put those boundaries in to ask for that or say no to things or say yes to things, those are all okay as well. And Chandler made a great point in terms of everyone's grief being different, um, very much based on the relationship that you had with that person, right? If someone is living in Canada and their loved one is in Germany and they're experiencing the progression of the disease, there is an there's an absence, right? They're not gonna experience the same way as a sibling who's actually there taking mom or dad to the doctor's appointments, coming in when they fall and doing that kind of stuff because they have a very different tangible relationship in that moment with that person. So um, relationship dynamics will also play into this as do values and belief systems. All right, so just in summary, I'm gonna read, which I read at the end of every time I do a grief talk, um, uh, the most beautiful explanation of what grief is like. Um, it came out of Reddit, if anyone's familiar with Reddit, and uh, this was something that was written by an older gentleman after someone younger had written and just kind of said, I just lost my best friend and I didn't know what to do. So this older gentleman responds and he says, all right, here it goes, I'm old. What that means is that I've survived so far, and a lot of people I've known and loved have not. I've lost friends, best friends, acquaintances, co-workers, grandparents, my mom, relatives, teachers, mentors, students, neighbors, and a host of other folks. I have no children, and I can't imagine the pain it must be to lose a child, but here's my two cents. I wish I could say you get used to people dying. I never did. I don't want to. It tears a hole through me whenever somebody I love dies, no matter the circumstances. But I don't want it to not matter. I don't want it to be something that just passes. My scars are a testament to the love and the relationship that I had for and with that person. And if the scar is deep, so was the love, so be it. Scars are a testament to life. Scars are a testament that I can love deeply and live deeply and be cut or even gouged and that I can heal and continue to live and continue to love. And the scar tissue is stronger than the original flesh ever was. Scars are a testament to life. As for grief, you find it comes in waves. When the ship is first wrecked, you you're drowning with wreckage all around you. Everything floating around you reminds me of the beauty and the magnificence of the ship that was and is no more. And all you can do is float. You find some piece of the wreckage and you hang on for a while. Maybe it's some physical thing, maybe it's a happy memory or a photograph. Maybe it's a person who is also floating. For a while, all you can do is float, stay alive. In the beginning, the waves are 100 feet tall and they crash over you without mercy. They come 10 seconds apart and don't even give you time to catch your breath. All you can do is hang on and float. After a while, maybe weeks, maybe months, you'll find the waves are still 100 feet tall, but they come further apart. When they come, they still crash all over you and wipe you out. But in between, you can breathe, you can function. You never know what's going to trigger the grief. It might be a song, a picture, a street intersection, or the smell of a good cup of coffee. It can be just about anything and the wave comes crashing, but in between waves, there is life. Somewhere down the line, and it's different for everybody, you find that the waves are only 80 feet tall or 50 feet tall. And while they still come, they come further apart. You can see them coming, an anniversary, a birthday, Christmas, or landing at O'Hare Airport. You can see it coming for the most part and prepare yourself. 
And when it washes over you, you know that somehow you will again come out the other side, soaking wet, sputtering, still hanging onto some tiny piece of the wreckage, but you'll come out. Take it from an old guy, the waves never stop coming and somehow you really don't want them to. But you learn that you'll survive them and other waves will come and you'll survive those as well. If you're lucky, you'll have a lot of scars from a lot of loves and a lot of shipwrecks. So I appreciate this is a very heavy topic. I will reiterate it was done in the Coles Notes fast version of anything around grief. I can stick around for a little bit while if people have questions or want to talk about it, but I'm also going to encourage you. I think we still have a couple of um, hours tomorrow where you can access the mental health services where people like myself or Chandler will, and Kat, mm, Kat yep, might be available to, to talk and help you through some of this stuff so that you uh, don't have to go home um, feeling worse than when you came into this room. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>